Still visiting here for a couple minutes. We'll get started in just a couple minutes here. Are you in Nebraska, man? Yeah, I'm in Nebraska. I couldn't believe that. Morning conversation stops. I'm just like, come on, man. You, you're a role model for all these kids. You gotta be something going on behind the scenes. I know. What if he was just all upset about not getting the job and was, you know, just in a bad frame of mind and got into fighting? Took out his girlfriend? I don't know. Is it girlfriend or wife? Yeah. The article I read just a few minutes ago said that said that he, he was, a, was a girl and it had, the girl had family there, so the family member observed all this and he choked her and drug her by her hair and punched her in the eye. Who do you think he is? Lars Phillips? Hmm? Lars Phillips. You can get into trouble for choking and. You got to rescue him. I got to talk to Donna. She's got to stop her. <laughs> oh, no. You got to rescue my police. All right, guys, it's 7 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and, and pray. <laughs> we're going to pray and we're going to get started. Lord, thank you for good conversation and uh, an opportunity to have fellowship together and, and eat together. Uh, just thank you for our time together. Lord, please open our eyes as we dive into Zechariah 5 and 6 and, and uh, dig into the details. Lord, let us not lose sight of what's the application that we're supposed to have in our own life and take away in our own life. So Lord, please bless our time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll shut down the Zoom if people don't join us here in the next little bit. But uh, so tonight we're in Zechariah 5. And uh, these are the last three and five, um, chapter 5, and then the first part of chapter 6. It's the last three visions out of the eight visions he saw. What a busy night that he sees eight visions in one night. He must, his head must have been just turning, swirling after this, you know. Uh, so these last three visions talk about judgment. And so we kind of have to parse through and figure out, okay, what is it talking about and how does it apply to us? So I'll go ahead and read the first four verses of Zechariah 5. It says, Then I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, or 30 feet. And its width is 10 cubits, which is 15 feet. Then he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side. And everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts. And it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. And it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and stones. So kind of an interesting vision. So what does he see? He sees this huge scroll. And I was kind of looking at this room, trying to picture 30 feet by 15 feet. He didn't measure. But, you know, if you picture, pretty much takes up this whole room that we're in. It's not rolled up, right? The scroll's not rolled up. It's spread out, kind of like a large sheet is spread out. And there's there's writing on both sides. What's the what's the writing on both sides? On one side it's talking about those who steal. Hey Jordan. On the other side it's talking about those who swear. And where am I getting that? Verse 3, it says, This is the curse that's going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away, according to the writing on one side. And everyone who swears will be purged away, according to the writing on the other side. My so, Bible says. What's yours say? Perjurer. Perjury? Perjurer. Perjurer? Perjurer. Okay. Which would be swears, right? Perjurer, someone who's lying. Um, so since the dimensions, Jordan, were in Zechariah 5. Since Could the, it be a law? What's that? 
Could it be the law that's uh, written? You're, you're getting ahead of me, but I was going to go there. <laughs> you said what was written. Yes, yes, I just wasn't there yet. <laughs> but if, can we? Can you hold that thought for a bit? Hold it. Okay. I'll take a bite. All right. <laughs> it's almost done. Um, it, do we have any clue what the what the significance is of the size? And whenever we're given measurements or dates or things like that, when we're given details, they're very specific. We want to ask. Why is it being so specific? Is there anything that that relates to? And we're not told, so we don't know for sure, but it's interesting that it's the exact same size as the tabernacle. The tabernacle was 20 cubits by 10 cubits. And I don't know what that, what that relevance is. Um, the tabernacle would have been... Jumbo. Reference for the 10 cubits wide. Do I have a reference? What do you mean? I mean, it says it's with the 10 cubits. Right, but the tabernacle was 10 cubits wide. Do I have a reference for that? Yeah. Uh, go, going back to Leviticus to check that out? I don't know why. Because I couldn't find it. You couldn't find it. Okay. Did you look too? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I didn't go and look. I saw that, that was a, I saw that in a commentary. I didn't check that commentary to see if that's what scripture said. Because right. I was wondering what the significance of the yeah. 20 and 10 was. Yeah. And I found that the curtain separating the holy from the holy of holies was 20 cubits. But as far as the width, I could not find it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's just, it, and even if we could find it, I mean, let's say it does say that the tabernacle is that size, still that doesn't really give me a, um, a, a great understanding of why that size is specific. And I just kind of wonder, would that have been more obvious to Zechariah than it is to, to us? To us, it just doesn't have, doesn't have that much meaning. Um, and that's where we, we want to be, I always have to remind myself to be careful. Ever since we studied James, which has been quite a few years ago that we studied James, but in James it talked about how be very careful what you, you know, what you teach because teachers will be um, under greater judgment and so on. All right, I don't want to say, well, it's this, when it's just my opinion on something, I've got to be very careful about that, about adding anything to it, so... Jewish, old ancient Jewish scribes said that the curtain separating the holy from holy holies was 20 by 10. Okay. Huh. So that's, that's tradition and not. That's tradition, yeah. So we, don't, we can't really tie a, a meaning to the size, but we, but we do, a lot of times we can when we have specifics like that. What are you thinking? Well, John? I just said when I read that, what came to my mind, not looking anything up, was uh, that the writer wanted us to know that it wasn't a small thing. Yes. They went, just wanted us to know that it was a big thing, and the numbers may be irrelevant, just the fact that it was big, not small. Right. That's what I took out of it when I read it. Initially. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. And it probably impressed them or shocked them on this, this big thing that's floating in the sky. And it's described as flying. Uh -huh, flying. Why, why is it described as flying? Why isn't why isn't it just laid out on the ground? Why is it or floating? Or floating? Why does it say it's flying? Flying indicates yeah, gets your attention. Now, I I don't know the the answer to that one, but I think I think it's to show that it's supernatural. Okay. It's not physical of the earth. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. If it's flying, we'd be like, okay, this is strange. The scroll's flying on its own. No jetpack. It's flying. <laughs> this is strange. So, yeah, that's that's a good point, too, that it's supernatural. Um, verse 3, uh, who, is the, who is this cursed being cast on? Before Fred tells us. Okay, I, and I'm sorry, um, it's specifically saying those who steal and uh, those who swear falsely, right? 
So what's interesting about that is that's the third commandment and the eighth commandment. Why just the third commandment and the eighth commandment? And when you look at the, at the two um, stones with those commandments on it, the third commandment's right in the middle and the eighth commandment's right in the middle. So it's the two on the pillars of stone, it's, it's the two middle. And so, Fred, what was your thought on that? I think the significance of the two is one is action, the other is thought. Oh, okay. That's not what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say, could it be talking about the whole law since it's... Um, and so, yes, I think it's talking about the whole law because it's either spoken or your actions or what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It like, it looks like one of the commandments is um, love, your, love the Lord with all your mind and soul. Yes. And so it kind of puts, it kind of replaces that because it says in verse... Um, verse 4, enters the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. So you're not loving the Lord with all your heart and soul mm -hmm. if you're swearing falsely by the Lord by, right. by your name. So again, it kind of relates to another law. Yeah, it does. And if you think of, of uh, thou shalt not steal, well, if you're killing, you're stealing a life. If you're committing adultery, you're stealing a marriage. You know, you, you can kind of see how those do uh, affect the whole law. Um, but, but it's speculation, too. It's speculation. We're speculating. We're, got to, we're just discussing. Really sure way too much into it. Could be. <laughs> now, what's interesting is... I've never done that before. <laughs> Fred's perfect. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's hard to be perfect. It's hard to be humble, <laughs> right, when you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so it says that um, this is going over the face of the whole land in the New American Standard. It says over the whole land. What does your version say? That's in in verse 3. Whole earth. Yours says the whole earth. What version do you have? I have the New King James. New King James, yeah. New King James says whole earth. Um, the Aramic Bible says the whole earth. The Septuagint says the whole earth. And the ISB says the whole earth. Everything else says over the whole land. So my question is, who, whose sin is this talking about? Is it talking literally about the whole earth? Or is it talking specifically about Israel? Well, it could be talking about the land mass of the earth. Okay. But, but still, is it, that's the whole earth compared to, is it Israel? I think it's the whole earth. You think it's the whole earth? Yeah. The Hebrew word is eretz. Eretz. Say it again, Fred. Eretz. E r e t s. Eretz. Is what? Yeah. Eretz. Eretz. No. What's it referring to? What is that? It's land. Earth land. Okay. Earth land. Earth and comma land is the definition. Yeah. So it's all. So it's all depending yeah. upon the context yeah. of. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's about the context. And when I look at the context, the context to me looks more like it's relating to Israel. Because this is Zechariah that he's talking to. And when we move on to the next vision, the context appears to be more Israel. So hold that. Yeah. I'm thinking it's the whole earth. Okay. Because I think it's the law and it's referring to Christ and him being the judgment at the time that the earth is redeemed. Okay, all right. And so it. he judges all sin, not just the sins of Israel. All right, and that makes that would make sense, that it's applying to the whole earth. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Well, because uh, also, but it says every perjurer shall be expelled. Okay. And the, Correct. And mm -hmm. Every thief. And so to me, it would be the Depends. Whole earth. Okay, okay. All right, good, good. Um, it, it, according to verse 3 and 4 what's the verse that's going to be carried out what's going to happen to them their sins are going to be judged how 
Hmm? Expelled? Yeah. What's what does that mean? Of of what? It, it says the covenant community. And it's not just not just them, their houses. Timber by timber, their houses are going to be completely destroyed. So the land's being cleansed. Has this happened? Is this a is this a past past judgment? Or is it a remember if it's the whole earth? Is this a past judgment or is it a future judgment? Yes. <laughs> yes? When's it happened in the past? From Zachariah's time. When's it happened in the past? I don't, I don't think it's happened in the past. From I think it's got to be future. Well, from Zachariah's time, from from Zachariah's time first, ask that answer that question. Is it is it past or future to Zachariah's time? Because that's the time that this is written in. Is it a literal house though? Ah, that's a good question. Is it a literal house? Literal house. Oh, on the prairie, a little house. Why do you more? And it will enter the house. When I was reading that, does that happen? Do my sins affect the people, the things around me? When Cain killed Abel, it said that the lamb cried out. Mm -hmm. So if we are sinning today, does that affect the land, our house? that we're currently with just, or is it all spiritual ah could it be spiritual it's an interesting question too isn't it um i don't think this judgment has happened yet i this i think this is i mean it it could not be before zachariah's time i think it's future and when i think of the judgments that are still to come upon the whole earth I think of the tribulation but when we look at the tribulation judgments this doesn't match the tribulation judgments and the tribulation judgments don't affect everyone people come out of it i'm wondering if this is judgments that will happen during the millennium maybe the liars and deceivers don't come out of it <laughs> yeah maybe so <laughs> however the judgments that are described for the from revelation 6 through revelation 18 don't match this no. so then i i would put it to the millennial period because and i think it's a i think it's a judgment a picture of judgment during the millennium the that it will be no yeah. no i think it's during the no i don't think it's great white throne i think it's during the millennium that jesus isn't gonna let sin reign He's going to be wiping it out as it happens. Because the people who go into the millennium have accepted Christ, but they're still in human bodies. So they can still sin. And then they're going to have babies during those thousand years, and they're going to grow up. But the babies are going to join the feast. Some will, some won't. Some will accept Christ. But Not the, all of them will. But the ones that don't get deceived That's by true. the devil. And so if they're judging destroyed in the middle of the money. That's true. Day. But it doesn't say they're destroyed. It says they're cast out of the covenant community. Where does it say that? Uh, let's see. I'm looking at the wrong, wrong one. Uh, let's see. Number, where is it? Uh, Verse 3 says, will be purged away according to the right. Yeah, purged away. I think they're dying. It's the curse going over according to the one side. And they're consumed in the, the four verse says it, house will be consumed with timbers and stones. So I, don't, I really don't see where it says. So it's twice in verse 3, 12, once in 3, and once in 4. Purged away. Oh, I'm sorry, no, it's it not. It just says purged okay. away on my version. Sorry, I'm looking at, I'm uh, thinking of the next, I think I'm thinking of the next. I've studied several passages here, so I'm getting the passages mixed up. So you're right. You're right. This says they'll be purged. So, oh, good point. Very good point. I'm not sure. Yep. I took purge away is basically dying. Yep. And so. True. Yeah.
But I still see it as during the millennium. If it's all, if it's, uh, everyone who swears to be purged away, and everyone who's steals purged away, then who's joining the devil, uh, the Satan at the end to fight against the, I think it's the end of the millennium. Okay. Yep. Uh, so when are you thinking it is then? I thought it was more than great white throne, great white judgment. Okay. But, uh, they're, they're quite matched there either because it doesn't say, you know, the stone enters anybody's house. It says that they're going to be brought against the judge. Mm -hmm. Not in the book of life. And they're going to be sent to the... So then what can we get out of this? We're all speculating. We are speculating, <laughs> but, but what's the, what is the firm thing we can get out of this? Because that's, I mean, we could, we could split hairs forever on this one passage, but what's one truth we can get out of it? Yeah. Lying or swearing. And he will deal with it. Stealing or lying, yeah. He he will take care of it in his time. Now we don't necessarily know when that time is, but he will what we see clearly is he will take care of it. it we kind of we kind of get impatient and want to take care of it ourselves in our own time. Mm -hmm. But he's going to take care of it. We are assured of that here. That is the one thing that we can I mean, if, if there's a summary, we could say he's he doesn't like it and he's going to take care of it. No one's going to get by with it, right? So that's kind of important for us to get. Anything else? Let's go on to the next passage. If no one has has anything else, do you have something else, John? No, I, I saved it for the end. Oh, we saved it for the end. He's <laughs> on his application. There's a lot more in there, but yeah. Yeah, but we're we're just, not going to split the hairs unless there's well, the word for scroll is interesting. All right, go ahead. It was used in Jeremiah when <clears throat> the scroll that Jeremiah wrote and gave to, or he had his assistant, I can't remember his name, read in the temple, and then it was read to the king, I thought. The king is Jehoiakim, maybe. And then he had a ripped up and burned it and then Jeremiah wrote the second scroll and when he said that he said to Jehoiakim no one of your descendants will sit on the throne that what? no none no. of his descendants will sit of, on okay. the uh -huh. okay, so what's the word for scroll though? you said the word for scroll was interesting well it's just how it relates back to Jeremiah Okay. and I think that points to Christ as far as being the scroll and it will be Christ that will be doing the judging. Oh, I absolutely agree with that, yeah. Christ will be doing the judging. Yeah, very good. And the word for oath or curse, um, the first time that's used is in Leviticus when it's talking about the woman who has no one witnessed her adultery. And I think that's all pointing back to us as far as who are we worshiping. Worshiping ourselves, or are we worshiping God? Mm -hmm. And so, if we're worshiping God, then we're redeemed, and then we're not going to be under the curse. If you're worshiping yourself or Satan, then you're going to be judged and cursed. Okay, very good, great summary. All right, let's go on to the next Number passage. <laughs> we're going on <laughs> five through eleven. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me. Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. Again, he said, this is, their, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there two women were coming out with the wind in their wings. And they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the ephah? Then he, hmm. then he said to me, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set, she will be set on her own pedestal. I lost connection here. Um, we'll try to get that back in a minute here. Um, 
Tina, if you're, you're watching my Zoom lost connection. Uh, so first thing we want to know is what's an ephah? <laughs> a basket. Mine's what's that? Basket. It's a basket? So what it's, you say literally? Basket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a measure. It's approximately a bushel basket. It's a dry measurement. Yes, an ephah is a measure of grain. Or in, in this case, it could be described, when you look at the Strong's, it could be described as a measuring basket the size of an ephah, which is a measurement of grain, and it can be compared to a bushel. So think of a bushel basket of, of grain. Okay, I'm going to just pause here for a second and see if I can get... This on. get Tina back on here. My Zoom just decided to go completely away. Sorry about that. Um, oh, I have no internet connection. That's why. Did your FaceTime not working? This is still working. That's strange. Huh. All yeah, right. Well, why don't you take it and see if you can make it make it work? And I'll just keep going here. Fix it, Chip. All right, um, so we see this ephah, this basket, this, this ephah-sized basket has a lead cover on it. What do we know about lead? Why would it be a lead cover? I'm guessing it might be heavy and strong. Yeah, yeah, the lead is, is going to, it's a, it's a heavy metal. Um, it's, when I think of lead, I think of contained you know, it's 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 containing it. Nothing's getting out of that that lead cover. Uh, so God's keeping the it. And, and in my translation, there in verse six, New American Standard translation, it said, "This is the ephah going forth." Again, He said, "This is their appearance in all the land." Another translation says, "This is their iniquity." or sin of the people in all the land. So it, this basket represents sin or evil, which is why it's described as a woman and, and it says, this is wickedness. This woman is wickedness. It's the wickedness of the people of all the land, but God's containing it in this bush, bushel basket with the lead cover on it. Um, and then we see inside the ephah and it, it says it's wickedness, but it's described as a woman. Why would wickedness be described as a woman, be depicted as a woman? Now, you men, be be careful with your... <laughs> only the women can answer well, this question. <laughs> you went to high school, right? What? <laughs> what, Fred? Well done. Well done? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know why. Do you have an idea, Sonia? Yeah. Could, yeah, it could be, could be ease kind of messed it up to where wickedness is always going to look like a, look like a woman. Every time there's a woman in it, it is bad place. Like it's, it's referred to as, yeah. That's how I, I mean. It could, it could be that. Yeah, it could be that. Another thing is, think it's, the word, yeah, the word wickedness is, is a feminine word and if you don't if you're not familiar with a romance language if you're f familiar with any of the romance languages the definite articles and the nouns are either masculine or feminine so in spanish la mesa the table la is a feminine article l is the male article mesa is a feminine noun so la mesa well wickedness in hebrew is a feminine word and so that could be why it's actually described as a female but it could also i think it's because it refers back to those that follow god follow christ are referred to as the bride of christ oh that's a good one yeah so are they worshiping god if they're not worshiping god then it's harlotry and then it would be so it'd be woman. So it's a wickedness of those that are not following God. And they have something else as their God. Yeah, that's a really good point. Which would tie into what you're going to talk about later as far as Babylon. You're and, right. And it'd be 
false religion, not following God and following. Okay. Sorry about that, Tina. I lost my Zoom. Uh, okay. Yes. Very good. Very That's good not point. Very good point. Um, so, whose wickedness? What? Oh, we're sorry. Uh, we're in uh, verse six of of uh, Zechariah five. We're talking about uh, the wickedness, the epa with the woman in it, um, which is wick. The, the woman is is a depiction of wickedness. Whose wickedness does this vision represent? Everyone that does not have faith in God. Is it everyone? Who does not have faith in God. Okay. Could be. But the and the wickedness is removed from the land and taken where? So well it's removed and taken to Shinar. But it's it's all leading to the revelation and the end of time. But do, are the Jews judged? Well, let me stop him in Han and say, what is a measurement? What is what? What is the Ebba? That you said it was a measurement. Yes, the Ebba is a measurement. What is a measurement? Grain. Typically, it's for measuring grain. So here, what is a measurement? It's measuring sin. So what measures sin? What measures sin? Who reveal what reveals sin? The law. So are Jews judged by one law, Gentiles by another law? No. So that's why I say it has to be all men and not okay. Jews. Okay, so Fred's saying that the, the wickedness is, is everyone. Good good uh, reasoning through that. And so it's pictured as as going um, to Shinar or Shinar. Why is the, the, the I gotta get a little accent in there and say Shinar. <laughs> Shinar is the appropriate way to say it. So why is the Ephah taken to Shinar? Remember, this is just a vision. But what, why would it be taken to Shinar and a pedestal built for it and it put up on this pedestal? What's another word for Shinar? So well, I don't know. Yeah. My reference is Daniel. <laughs> but my reference is Daniel 1, uh, 2, yeah, 1, 2, that says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, mm -hmm. so to the house of his God, and he brought the articles which he had carried in the house of his God, a small sheep. Right? Shinar is an ancient term for Babylon. Okay, and uh, so Zechariah is being given a, an interesting picture of the removal of sin being carried off to Babylon. Why would that be? Why would that ring a bell for Zechariah? Who's Zechariah? Who are the people of this time? Remember what they're doing? They've just returned from captivity in Babylon. Captivity in Babylon to rebuild the temple in Israel. And so they're getting a picture of sin being taken to Babylon. Why? For judgment. For judgment, which relates to what? Where have we seen Babylon represented before? Well, it's actually like 200. I'm not sure if I'm right on this number, but I want to say it's something like 283 times in all of the Bible is Babylon. I'm probably I'm throwing that out. I don't remember if that's the exact number. But Babylon is mentioned a whole lot. And whenever we see the word Babylon, we basically can think of rebellion from God. So rebellion from God is kind of what we think of when we see Babylon. Remember in our study of Revelation, Revelation 17 and 18, the the one world government economic religious system is called Babylon, right? It's rebellion against God. So, isn't this a double meaning for him? How so? Well, he just got, they just got back from Babylon. Yep. And they kind of hopefully know why they were exiled in Babylon because they were 
worshiping idols and not listening to the prophets and following God. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, that kind of, what do you call it, would, would be fresh in their mind, I would think. I don't I'm just speculate that they remember why they went to Babylon in the first place or why they were exiled to, to, uh, to Babylon. To Babylon. So they and then also then, like you said, the second, the double, the second reference is that the, all the Babylon reference in, in Revelations where it's the false religious global, what do you call it, the global um, religion and the false idols, following idols back in, in the future. Mm -hmm. So they had, the, the sin, the major sin that they had um, done that made them be taken into captivity and exiled to Babylon was worshiping idols. They were worshiping idols instead of worshiping God. So, and God warned them and warned them and warned them and they refused to repent of it. And so they went off into exile for 70 years. Now they're back and what are they doing? They're building a temple. And that temple is to represent God but not be something that they worship in place of God. So as they're building this temple, this is a reminder to them, but could it have dual meaning? Yeah, it can have dual meaning that there's a spiritual Babylon of the future, which we're seeing the rise of now. And what is that? It's all about me, not about God. It's do whatever pleases me, not what pleases God. So we see that same spirit. Will God let that go based on what we just saw in the previous vision? No, no. He's got it under control. In his time, he's going to take care of it. And it's not going to be taken off to Babylon and to physical Babylon and put up on a pedestal. It's going to be taken care of and eliminated. But the other interesting thing is um, kind of the history of Babylon. And Fred's the one that first said this to me. That um, I think you said it in our Genesis study, way back when we were studying Genesis, that the very first rebellion against God was the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. That was the first time they were trying to be their own God, where God was saying, multiply, and, well, I'm talking about after they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, okay? After, sorry, thanks for clear. <laughs> after they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, what happened? It's It was in the land of Shinar that they tried to uh, build the Tower of Babel, where they were refusing to uh, disperse over all the earth instead they're congregating so no we're going to build something after our own name and glorify glorify us where was that babylon so it's like you see why rebellion against god is called it we see the term babylon associated with it fred what else do you have to add on to that it's in genesis 14 i can't remember the name but earlier in genesis God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. It was in Shinar that they said, we're going to stay here, congregate, and make a name for ourselves, where they were making themselves to be God. Mm -hmm. So, yep. next time Shinar is mentioned is with the battle of five armies and four armies, where it was a king. Yep from Shinar and three others, four signifying the world, coming to Abraham. Abraham actually was to like Sodom and Gomorrah and Yep. Yep, and he would not um, And so then they took Lot captive mm -hmm. and took him off, but then Abraham and three hundred went after him. Took Rescued a lot them. Back, yep. Which was amazing because it was five armies could not defeat the four armies, but Abraham with 300. It shows it was God. Yep. Yeah. Correct. It shows it's God. Um, is Israel, you know, so Israel has no longer built images to worship. 
since that time. They learned that one. Okay, except they kind of got crazy over the second temple later on. But um, so is Israel no longer rebelling against God now? I'd say they still are. The the vast majority of Israel is secular, just like in this country. Vast majority is secular. They are not people of faith. The ones that are people of faith, the majority of the Jews that are very um, zealous Jews are focused on, kind of like Pharisees focused on Judaism. They don't know Jesus. There's a minority that know Jesus, like Amir Sarfati is one of them that we, we know of and we follow. There is that minority who is trying to share, and there is a growing number of those who are becoming faithful in Jesus, but it's a very small number today. So Israel is not faithful today. God, and we saw when we were um, reading in Ezekiel 37 and 38 that, remember it said, God returned them to their land first, and then he will put his spirit in them. He hasn't put his spirit in them yet. They haven't come to faith yet. We're going to see that come to fruition at the end of Zechariah, but we're not we're not there yet. So, um, very interesting. Um, where are we on time? I just heard um, someone that I met that he lives in Israel. He was saying that uh, the good news they they guesstimate about a million million Jews. In Jesus, about a million out yeah, of what is the population of? 16, 16 million. Okay. All here, around the world, you know, something like that. Okay. All right. So a million Jews, but not in, not a million Jews in, in Israel. Israel. No, I, Just a million Jews out of yeah. 16 million mm -hmm. believers. So the number is, is increasing. That's, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, it is. So out of Zechariah 5, um, what's, what's the... What's the message that you get? What's the key thing that, that stands out to you? I mean, these visions are kind of kind of hard to put our finger on. And if you were just reading through this, it would be easy to just go, well, I don't really get that, and go right on. Or you can stop and say, Lord, what is it that I'm supposed to? What's one thing I'm supposed to take from this? <laughs> For me, it's the same as what it was on Sunday, but it's worship God. Is a short answer. Long answer is throughout the uh, chapter five, two is repeated. Not necessarily the number two, but you have two women with storage wings. You have two sins. You have mm -hmm. 20. You have two illustrations. Two is all over the place. Huh. And if you look at symbolism of numbers in the Bible, it's two is two contrasting views. Mm -hmm. And what it's saying to me is, is that you have worship, worship of God, or you have worship that is not God, whether it's worship of yourself, worship of Satan, worship of whatever. So you have those that have the true Redeemer and those that are trying to find their own redemption through the false religion. Okay. And two in number also means witness sometimes. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Mine was. Don't be, don't be discouraged about this world that, that God has everything under control in His and in His timing. He will He will punish or re, re, take revenge or have justice over this this land. Yeah, yeah, because it would be easy to get discouraged mm -hmm. when we see uh, just the news. Sin the news. Just, 
Yeah, sin's not just flourishing. It's like they're pouring gasoline on it all over the place. It's just mm -hmm. going crazy. Yeah. And, and it would be easy to go, gosh, you know, what's the point? And the point is, focus God's on, got it under control. Yeah, he God really does have sin under control. He really does have a timeline and a plan, and we can trust in that. Because we've seen history and how he has in his time, taking care of it. And in his time, he will take care of it again. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Don't get discouraged. John, what have you got? Well, in keeping with the tradition of what I get out of it and what I can do with it, uh, the, the scroll, the big scroll, attention grabbing, those who steal or swear falsely, I can, and you, you touched on it a little bit, can really be tied to all commandments mm -hmm. in a way. So big attention. All commandments and then the end of five it just refers to sins in the basket so I look at it as being everything and the bottom line to take away is sin is sin don't overlook my little sin because it's not as bad as your big sin sin is sin specifically at the end of five and falsely and, and uh, stealing can be tied to all sin that's what I got good when you said scroll that's how the word of God was written it's on the scroll. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very good. Does it tell you some things? What does it tell you, Amos? What do you take away from it? When that, just that one? No, from chapter 5, what do you take away? Chapter 5, I mean, uh, God, God's always trying to get someone's attention, you to pay attention to what he's saying to you. Okay. okay. Whatever. I think there's still, I mean, I think in the canon, those prophecies are, proof but sometimes we have to evaluate if, if we really hear in God that he does does communicate with us too Tina what about you just knowing that God's there for us that God's knowing that God's there for us encouragement in spite of of uh, everything you see going on is that what you mean yes okay Tina, I'm glad you're joining us. I can tell you got a cold, but thank you for for joining us in spite of that. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Um, so, I'm mine is back on what where Fred touched of of who who am I worshiping? Um, you know, it's it's easy to come to church on Sunday and then be thinking about God. It's easy to come to church on Thursday. And to be thinking about God, but what am I doing the rest of the time? Am I really focusing my day on making sure my actions and my words and my focus is God? Or am I getting so wrapped up in in me and my plan and my list and what I'm dealing with? And am I remembering that in the middle of the chaos? of my day-to-day -day life, am I still truly not putting God on the back burner, but is he front and center with everything that I'm doing? Because it makes a difference of what light I'm shining. Is the light that I'm shining just me, ho-hum, going through the day? Or is the light that I'm shining really that I'm living for Jesus today? That's you know, I, I thought about this was on my mind. I was talking to Larry Hunter about this. Um, I, I think it was when I was looking at Genesis, Genesis 11 and the fact of talking about Babylon and Babel and that when they built that tower, they were making a name for themselves. And it occurred to me, I was thinking of our license plate, our car license plate. And our car license plate is N-E-Y-L-S. N-E for Nebraska, Y-L-S. Wiles, Nebraska Wiles. Why on earth did I put something that represented our name on a license plate? Why didn't I come up with something that represented God's name? I wasn't thinking about God at that point. I mean, I could have come up with a Bible verse to, to put on there to send a message of God. Instead, I put our name on there. That bothered me. bothered me a bit. I guess there's a reason that you put Nebraska Wiles is because you're following God's command to come to well, that, that's a, a nice way of saying it, but at the time I was just coming up with something clever. I was using space 
where they I tried to give you the bit of the You did. You tried to give me the bit of the doubt. But, but the truth is that's an easy way out. Yeah, I know. That's that's good. But it's not truthful. I mean it just I I have to make sure that I'm I'm focusing on getting Jesus out there. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. So that that hit me. I it's probably not even the main message of this, but that really hit me this week that I've been thinking. So no. the next license page will not change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might not be any while. That's for a while. Soon. Um, we're, we don't have time to dig into Zechariah 6 tonight, but you guys do have the discussion questions. And I just want to give you a, a heads up. The first part of it, verses 1 through 8, it's the last vision. And it's once again a vision on judgment. And I think in this vision, we see the law of double reference of it having... Um, application a couple different applications and then when we get to the the second part of it it's no longer a vision then it's a command then Zachary is just like okay comes out of the vision and then God's given them a command and the command that he's giving them is to act something out that's prophetic that's prophecy and to to understand that you got to dig in and understand what the names are so there's kind of a preface for next week when we get into to Zechariah 6. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and pray and we'll close for tonight. Lord, thank you for giving us um, great discussion for Zechariah 5 and letting us really chew on it and, and toss it around and be able to come up with something that we can each apply to our lives and take with us which is sometimes hard to do. Sometimes we just want to read and then move on. Lord, help us to slow down. Help us to make sure that we are listening to what you are saying to us so that we are truly living it out and shining your light and your message, not our light and not what's about us. Lord, I specifically want to, to lift up Crystal tonight as um, they had the celebration of life service for randy um and tomorrow being the the funeral um lord i pray that the winds blow west and not east for her that's very important for this tonight that they uh the winds are not coming from the west as they gather to um to just celebrate randy lord i just pray that that crystal would be feeling your touch, feeling your embrace, um, feeling you lifting her up and just sustaining her through this. Uh, and, and Lord, I pray that in the coming days, the coming weeks and months, that you give her the direction she needs. Very clearly, very strongly, she knows what it is that you want her to do uh, going forward with the farm and decisions about her treatment for her, her breast cancer, um, Lord, please surround her with family and friends that love her. Let us, her, her uh, extended church family here, lift her up. Uh, and uh, there are others also that are dealing with, with uh, health issues and scary diagnoses, Lord. And uh, you know who those people are, but I don't have permission at this point to share. So I'm just going to ask, Lord, that we be praying. Um, anonymously for those people and that they would they would know that we're lifting them up but more more than anything lord that they would feel your touch um, in the days ahead we pray all of this in jesus name amen keep the chairs and tables up yeah we'll use them for thanks everybody for joining us tonight we'll see you next week